the swing of the state's budget numbers in just a few short months has been pretty dramatic, as viewed by Ohio's budget director. Two months ago, at the end of February, beginning of March, Ohio's budget was actually $250 million ahead of our estimates. And OBM, as always, estimates very conservatively. So we expected going into this budget to have some surplus at the, at the end. Um, that has changed dramatically in the last two months in the face of the COVID crisis. We are now $776 million under estimate. So that has been more than a billion dollars swing just in two months. Now, the biggest hits are in the biggest areas of the budget. You've got Medicaid, K through 12 schools, higher education. Let's start with Medicaid. Yes. Uh, during a global pandemic with 1.1 million people who have filed for unemployment, why is Medicaid an area that is being targeted for cuts? Well, Karen, Medicaid is one of the largest sections of the state budget. And we are not in any way going to reduce services to individuals or change eligibility. What we do need to do, though, is look at the rates that we pay our managed care companies. This is something that we do every single year, usually every six months, renegotiate those rates. And during the past several months, during the pandemic, utilization has actually been lower than expected, given some of the orders related to um, services at hospitals and other um, places like that. So it is actually something that we can do to um, constrain the state budget a little bit without impacting those important services to individuals during the pandemic. But as the pandemic goes on, people may be avoiding hospitals, maybe avoiding seeking care now because they're afraid of contracting COVID-19, but there's gonna be a time when people are gonna start going back to hospitals and, and healthcare facilities, and also potentially more people signing up for Medicaid. Absolutely, we do expect Medicaid enrollment to increase over the next several months. We also do expect um, utilization to increase. And like I said, there is this ongoing process where we renegotiate those rates usually every six months. And that is a process that is coordinated through our Department of Medicaid and in working with the, the federal agency that regulates Medicaid as well. Now with education, I noticed that colleges and universities took a 3.8% cut across the board, but the cuts are different for K through 12 schools depending on the school district's wealth, it looks like. How were those cuts calculated though? And did you get any pushback from lower income districts that can ill afford cuts or higher income districts who have said that they're not getting their fair share from the state in the first place? The state education budget each year is calculated based on the wealth of the local school districts. And so we thought it would make sense to apply the cuts and that kind of a methodology as well. So the method we used is a per pupil adjustment that is adjusted for the wealth of the district. So those lower wealth districts that have less capacity to raise revenue locally and do things like that to adjust their budgets are being reduced less per pupil than those districts that have more local resources available to them. And given the size of the education budget and its proportion to the state budget, it would not be possible to completely hold education outside of the cuts, but we have tried to apply a mechanism that gives those with the less means to raise money locally the, um, the ability to be cut less proportionately. Now, the governor had talked about in his budget the wraparound services, $550 million, I think, for wraparound services such yes. as food aid and mental health services and that sort of thing. Is that money possibly going to be cut? So that money had already been dispersed this fiscal year. So the payments were already made to schools in October and February, so before the pandemic um, was upon us. As we go forward into fiscal year 21, that is a priority for the governor to maintain those services and that funding as much as possible. So that will be a priority as we look ahead. House Speaker Larry Householder said this week that uh, he's suggesting lawmakers might dip into the rainy day fund to help offset some of those school costs. Can lawmakers do that without coordinating that with the governor? Um, we will obviously continue to work with the General Assembly as we go throughout this um, biennial process. We have, um, the governor has announced these reductions by executive order. The legislature can um, adjust appropriations and we can work with them throughout this process. We will continue to move forward and OBM is in the process of doing a, an updated projection 
both of fiscal year 20 and going forward to fiscal year 21. And we do expect to continue to have ongoing conversations with the legislature and the leadership of the General Assembly throughout this process. But the idea was not to dip into the rainy day fund yet because, as DeWine said, we don't know what the future holds. Exactly. We are expecting to need to use those funds in the next fiscal year and potentially beyond. We, um, we are working with economists to project what the recovery looks like, what the shape of that recovery curve might be. And we do expect it to take longer than just fiscal year 21 to really get back to where we were before the onset of the pandemic. So it's important that we maintain our savings account as long as we can to plan for the future. One of the areas that did not get cut is the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, where coronavirus is apparently spreading rapidly as resulting, as we see in the results from mass testing in prisons. What's the rationale to not do any cuts in the prisons area? The um, Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections is very much funded through personnel services. That is their biggest cost. And reducing personnel in prisons in the midst of a pandemic is just not something that's feasible to do in two months time. We will, going forward, looking to FY21, likely be making adjustments to prison operations, but that is just something that is a longer term challenge and something that um, we, we're, we're not able to do really quickly during this two month period. But looking ahead, I do expect there to be some adjustments to that budget in the next um, fiscal year. As I understand it, about one in four state workers do work in the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction yes. in some way. There's about 51,000 state workers right now. You have said that you don't expect layoffs before the end of this fiscal year, July 1st, but what about going forward? Should state workers expect layoffs? So we are looking at, again, re projecting that fiscal year 21 budget, and we will need to utilize all of the tools in our toolbox to adjust the fiscal year um, 21 spending. And I think that there will likely be several changes to our personnel budget. And I can't predict exactly what those changes might be, but we have to keep everything on the table at this point in time. Is there a rationale though for not doing layoffs now where those employees could potentially file for unemployment, get this, uh, the pandemic unemployment insurance and, and maybe have some of that shored up? as they go into the job market? Well, we do think that we need to maintain our staffing now during the pandemic, especially in those areas that are kind of direct service and they're therefore directly um, assisting with the pandemic response. And then um, again, going forward and into the next fiscal year, we will be looking at many different options, not just layoffs to adjust our personnel expenses. Now, I know you can't speak directly for uh, Governor DeWine, but obviously you're in the administration. Um, when he saw these revenue numbers, which you obviously do monthly revenue reports mm -hmm. and, and he sees them, did those numbers, as they were really declining, did that play a role in his decision to make the announcements about reopening certain industries and, and some of the things that are do, being done to reopen the economy now? Well, Karen, we, um, I began briefing the governor on our projections back in March. And that is when, you know, we were, he was first making these decisions and he has not changed his approach. And that is we need to first deal with the pandemic and the health of our citizens and the economic recovery will follow that. And as we have flattened that curve, we're now looking at reopening. The two are not, um, tied in, in the way that I think you were explaining. It is, it is more of just the time frame that we're in now. And you know, back in March, when we saw some of the initial um, data coming in from the sales tax, for example, during the last two weeks of March, that is when he first announced the spending controls like the hiring freeze and purchasing freezes and travel freezes for state employees. So we implemented those right at the onset so that we could control costs going forward. 
there's kind of an interesting thing in the budget that it's not all down. There are two areas where tax revenue was actually shown <laughs> to be up. Cigarette taxes revenue was up uh, 20 and a half percent and uh, the increase in alcohol tax revenue up 24.4 percent. Now, that's not a whole lot of money in terms of actual dollars, I guess, but is there a concern that that's going to be a problem in the future? You know, that is a proportionately small portion of our GRF tax revenue budget, but it was something that I noticed when I have been looking at the data as well. And I think that that does um, marry up with the trends that we are seeing nationally. There's been a lot of reports that cigarette sales and alcohol sales are up. Obviously, that is not, um, from a health perspective, something that we ever want to see. And that could, of course, pose challenges going into the future. But um, you're correct. Some of that could be timing. You know, when we do monthly projections, it it's some of these smaller revenue sources, especially, can fluctuate from month to month. And it's, it's hard to estimate exactly what will come in each month from those different sources. But it does look like those are trending up. So I do expect that we will recover on the other side of this pandemic and Ohio will um, regain that momentum that we saw even just as early, you know, as recently as January and February of this year. And as you try to correct for this and try to patch these budget holes, is there potentially the possibility that some of these loopholes that many groups have advocated to be eliminated could potentially be back on the table? I'm thinking of like the, the small business tax cut that uh, uh, allows for small businesses to take the first $250,000 of their income tax free. Karen, I would expect there to be a lot of discussions about those um, types of things, especially as we start planning for the next Biennium. The next biennial budget will be here before we know it. We'll, um, we, OBM and the agencies, will be begin planning that budget this summer, and we will. Um, the governor will introduce that budget next February. So that is not very far away, and I would expect there to be robust conversations about many items during that time frame.